Hello, welcome back to Teen Story Share. This week we're continuing What We Need to Survive by Kaylee Elizabeth. If you missed last week's reading, I will link that down below for you. And we're going to be reading chapter three today. We arrive at the orphanage at 2.42 p.m., exactly on time, as Mrs. Baker proudly states. The building is an old brick, three-story structure the size of a small school. It's in the middle of the country, with a cornfield on one side and a large playground on the other. It's gated in, immediately making me panic. It's basically a prison. Mrs. Baker tells the speaker outside the gate that we arrived, and the gate promptly opens. We drive and park in front of the double door entrance and are instructed to gather our belongings and exit the car. Our belongings. That's funny. We have one duffel bag and a backpack filled with a few clothing items and a picture of Mama. We never had much as kids. Most of our money went to Father's drinks, but we made it work, never needing much because we had each other. Well, Mama, Lily, and I had each other. I throw the backpack over one shoulder, the duffel bag over the other, and grab Lily's hand, which is tightly gripping mine. We walk about 17 steps to the double doors and find a woman in her early 60s waiting with a grin. She has white hair that she keeps short, small spectacles that sit on the bridge of her nose, and she is rather round. However, her eyes are warm, which allows me to slightly relax. Maybe she won't be too bad. Rosalinda and Liliana Hart, it is lovely to meet you. Please come in. She opens the door for us and we follow her and Mrs. Baker into a large foyer. The floor is wooden and there are pictures of famous works of art that line the wall. There is a chandelier in the center of the room and a few chairs scattered about. No other children are in sight. We continue down a long hallway, passing a dining room and a few classrooms along the way. At the end of the hall, there is an office with a love seat, desk, and chair, along with a certificate of some sort hung on the wall. A bookshelf is lined with books. I read some of the titles. Helping the Troubled Teen, Open Wounds, Healing the Hearts of Orphaned Children. I shake my head. Orphanage Lady instructs us to sit down, with Mrs. Baker standing in the background. I sit, and Lily basically sits on my lap, leaning all her weight into my side, obviously terrified. I stroke her hair, just like Mama once did to me when I was scared. I'm Mrs. Sullivan. I am the headmaster of Golden Streak Orphanage of Pennsylvania. Our orphanage seeks to provide comfort and a temporary home for children, until you find your forever family. She makes it sound like we're dogs in a shelter waiting to find our forever family. We currently have 10 children here with two pending placements. The youngest is three and the oldest is 17. So I'm not the oldest, but I wonder how long the 17 year old has been here. We have a strict weekly schedule that consists of classes, chores, meals, and free time. The weekends are used for relaxation and homework. We have a television room, a playroom, three classrooms, two bedrooms for the girls and one for the boys. We also have a library on the third floor, though the younger kids aren't that interested in it. There are multiple staff members that have rotating shifts throughout the days, providing care where needed. We eat meals together in the dining hall and go to church every Sunday. I don't foresee you girls having any problems adjusting, but always know that we are here to help. You can talk to us if you feel stressed or alone, and we encourage you to consult your peers as well, for many have undergone similar situations. I doubt anyone understands what we went through. Chrissy, one of the social workers, will show you girls to your room. You are sharing it with two other girls around Liliana's age. Do you have any questions before you follow Chrissy? A single tear slides down Lily's cheek and she leans closer into my side. I understand it's scary, but there's no need to be scared, little one. Isn't that right, Rosalinda? Honestly, I'm terrified out of my mind, but can't let Lily see that. So I nod and give Miss Sullivan a half smile and give Lily a kiss on the head. We'll be okay, Lils. It's just like a long sleepover with friends. Lily tries to smile, but I can tell she's not convinced. We say our goodbyes to Mrs. Baker, who instructs us to be good girls and listen to Miss Sullivan and the staff. We then follow Chrissy to our new bedroom. The bedroom is small. There are four beds, one in each corner of the room, a small nightstand next to each bed, and a round pink carpet in the middle of the wooden floor. 
Each bed has a handmade quilt and flat pillow. Honestly, the room is in better condition than our house back in Kentucky. Two girls curiously stare as we enter. Samantha, Annie, this is Rosalinda and Liliana. They'll be your new roommates. Chrissy says this as if it's a fun sleepover at our best friend's house. If only she realized we were all here because our parents failed us. Well, not Mama. She would never have put us in an orphanage. Samantha and Annie shyly smile and wave as Chrissy shows us to our beds and tells us to settle in. Since it's Friday afternoon, the afternoon is free time until dinner. So feel free to unpack and explore until the dinner bell rings. I'll be around if you need anything. She smiles at us and I try to return it, but can't bring the sides of my lips upward, so I end up just starting and frowning. Chrissy turns and leaves and I begin to unpack our bag as Lily sits on her bed. Lily and I only have three outfits each and an old picture of Mama. I place the picture of Mama on my nightstand and put our clothes in the drawers. Unpacking is quick when you come from a poor past. Annie, an olive-skinned little girl with long, straight black hair, probably slightly older than Lily, approaches us. I'm Annie. Do you want to come play outside on the swings with me? Annie seems pretty cheery for being an orphan. Lily looks at me concerned. As much as I would love Lily to be by my side, I know she needs to adjust, and the best way for that to happen will be for her to play with girls her own age. I sit next to Lily, who is pale with anxiety. How about you go play with Annie? Maybe she can show you all the fun things to do. How does that sound, Annie? Yeah, I've been here my whole life, so I know all the fun activities. Her whole life. Those words resound in my head, but I brush them aside to avoid feeling any sort of emotion. Will you come too, sissy? Lily looks at me with puppy dog eyes. I'll come check on you in a few minutes, okay? I have to finish settling us in, but I promise I will be right there. Lily holds out her pinky for a pinky promise, something we have done since she was a baby. I return it and kiss her forehead, and she follows Annie out the door. I pretend to busy myself in making sure every wrinkle is out of our clothing, when Samantha, who is sitting on her bed with a sketchbook, speaks. How old are you? I'm 16. How about you? Samantha is a dark-skinned, skinny girl with long, dark cornrows. She's a beautiful little girl with bright brown eyes that look like chocolate. I'm 11. Got transferred here when I was 8 because my foster parents sucked. Annie's 7. I nod in response because I don't know what else to say. Samantha isn't bothered by this and goes back to drawing. Rather than busying myself with non-existent tasks, I decide to explore for a few minutes before checking on Lily. I walk out of the room and down the hallway, finding another girl's bedroom and also the boy's bedroom. No one is present in either of the rooms, so I assume they are outside or in the common room. I make my way to the spiral staircase that leads to the third floor. Ms. Sullivan claims there is a library on this floor, so my curiosity has gotten the best of me. As I take the final step upstairs, sure enough, there is a single room filled with books. I run my hand across a row of books, which leaves a thick layer of dust on my fingers. Ms. Sullivan wasn't kidding when she said no one comes up here. I weave in and out of the aisles of books reading different titles. There are books of multiple genres, from history to science to self-help to fantasy. I go to the back of the room and find a window seat. It's a worn down blue seat with baby blue pillows that have pink flowers on them. It sits in a semicircle, three paneled window that overlooks the playground outside. I sit with my back against a flat, dusty pillow and gaze out of the window until I spot the blonde braid of my sister. She's swinging with Annie and another little boy. She smiles slightly as the little boy leaps from the swing, does a twirl, and falls to the ground laughing at his failed attempt to stick the landing. I sigh a small breath of relief, seeing my lily pad experiencing a little bit of normalcy. She deserves at least that after all she's been through. Yelling, bang, screaming, bang, bang. Lily sobs into my shoulder, begging me to make it stop, and the 911 operator asks me what is happening. The closet doorknob frantically turns, and he screams, Open this door right now, young lady! You look like you're a million miles away. A boy's voice draws me back to reality, and makes me gasp as the seat shifts from the weight of someone sitting on the other side. I look and see a boy, no, more like a young man, sitting across from me. He has hazel eyes and shaggy brown hair that he flips away from his tanned face. 
He has light facial hair but keeps it trimmed, looking very mature. He smiles a grin that reveals his straight white teeth and chiseled jawline. I must look panicked because he says, Hey, it's okay. Sorry, didn't mean to scare you. I stare. I can't form words. Ever since father, I mean that day, I haven't been able to speak directly to men. So I just stare with my mouth hanging open. The young man doesn't seem bothered by this reaction, but continues to smile and talk. I'm Joseph. I see you found the hidden library. He waves his hand, indicating the many books that surround us. I like to come up here sometimes, get a good book, settle down in a corner somewhere, and escape for a while, you know? I try to give him a small smile in agreement, but it comes out in more of a shrug. An escape. Oh, how I would love to escape my mind for a bit. Joseph continues, unfazed by my muteness. Maybe he's used to weird new kids. I've been here for five years and still have yet to read all the books, but that's my goal before I turn 18 next year and am kicked out. So he's the 17 year old. Anyhow, what's your name? I force my jaw to move and my brain to work. Rosie. It comes out in barely a whisper, but Joseph still hears it. Rosie. Well, Rosie, I know this isn't the most ideal place to land yourself, but we are happy to have you here. If you ever need anything or need someone to talk to, I'm your guy. I give him a half smile, half shrug in response. I don't mean to be rude. I genuinely have not been able to get my brain to clearly think these days. I go back to looking out the window, thinking maybe Joseph will leave and I can go back to my thoughts, but he doesn't. Lots of little kids around here. I'm sure they'll be placed soon. I see we got another little one today. See that cute little blonde down there on the swings? She came today too. Cute as a button. I'm sure she'll be placed in no time. This statement brings me back to reality. I never thought of Lily being placed without me. I can't let that happen. No, I exclaim and slam my hand to my lap before I can settle myself. Joseph looks surprised by my outburst. I feel my cheeks flush, both from anger and embarrassment. I brush the palms of my hands on my lap to get rid of the dust and sweat and put my head down in shame. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to yell. It's just Lily, the little blonde, is my sister. Joseph's face goes from surprised to sympathetic. I see he understands my outburst as he knows kids our age don't get adopted. Hey, no need to apologize. I should be the one apologizing. I didn't know she was your sister. I refuse to make eye contact because he's being so kind and I'm being rude. And if I look at him, I might do something stupid like cry. Instead, I study the skin around my thumbs that I begin to pick away. You know, you never know. You could both be placed, Joseph exclaims, attempting to resolve the awkward silence. I'm 16. I look at him briefly, then back at my hands, but I see the empathetic look in his eyes and he swallows. Well, it's never impossible. Thankfully, the awkward situation is interrupted by a bell, which Joseph tells me indicates dinner. We both silently get up and I follow him down to the main floor to the dining hall, where I see Lily waiting with a seat saved for me. I glance one last look at Joseph before going to Lily. Thank you. I say, hoping to avoid any awkward encounters in the future. This time, he gives me a half smile and nod in response and walks over to a group of 12 year old boys at the table. I sigh, put on a fake smile and go to Lily who grabs my hand as dinner begins to be served. All right, I hope you're liking the story so far and next week we'll be reading chapter four. Have a great weekend. See you again next time. Bye-bye.